I have just watched the third episode of Chasing the Sun, or <laughs> as some people have jokingly said it should be called, Chasing the Effing Sun. Yeah, there's a few more F-bombs in this one, but there was a whole lot of emotion and and inspiration and passion. And once again, following on from my review of the first two episodes, which you haven't, haven't seen already, uh, it's in the feed down below. I did that last week. Um, this is absolutely outstanding, this documentary series, and there's two episodes to go. Uh, in episode three, just, just going to run you through my thoughts. Uh, obviously, if you haven't seen it and you want to see it, then uh, by, by all means do that before you watch this review. I guess there's not spoilers so much because we know we know how the game ended. We know what happened at the Rugby World Cup, but there's so much detail. The curtain properly gets pulled back by South Africa and the, the level of access again and the level of detail that you get is outstanding. And I grew up like a lot of people in the UK watching Living With Lions, the 1997 documentary, which was an absolute game changer, not just in rugby, but in sport. Sporting documentaries had never been done like that before, and it completely changed the way things were done. Uh, this, this again, this is the best thing rugby's done since then, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and it's the closest that rugby's ever got to doing what the NFL do with the absolute total access that they get. And once again, I came away from watching Chasing the Sun episode three thinking, what a shame that the, the teams didn't give the Netflix crew that sort of access during the Six Nations and hopefully they will for the second season of, of that Six Nations documentary. So episode three picks up uh, with a review of the Ireland game. Uh, South Africa have just lost that pool match and the honesty uh, from Rassi Erasmus to his team, the standards that he sets. I mean, he called out Peter Steff de Toy for being submissive in his body language. I love that for so many reasons. Firstly, you know, the, the great Peter Steff de Toy, no one is above criticism in that camp and the total honesty. And they all take it on the shoulders and take it on the chin and react. But it's also, I just love that kind of um, old school mentality. There's a lot of people that will tell you now that rugby's not about collisions and uh, rugby's um, ma masculinity shouldn't be celebrated. No, bollocks. <laughs> and this episode and that team and rugby in general it just celebrates why people watch rugby why people love rugby why people play rugby absolutely uh, and you see this throughout the episode Razi Erasmus is just building up his players to intimidate France when they get to a quarter final and rugby is kind of legal bullying that, that's kind of the whole point of the sport and that might not be politically correct to say but it is how it is and Razi Erasmus talks about um, the egos that are in the room saying what was the quote um, your heads are getting bigger than your abilities so feet firmly back on the ground and then we see Sir Khaleesi um, questioning himself and in the context of the journey that he was on even to be at the World Cup we see his a glimpse of his journey from that ACL injury and in four months to be named in the World Cup, uh, the, the South Africa World Cup squad, which is it's just absolutely remarkable. And there's three occasions in this episode where I felt very choked up. I'll be honest. I, I don't know how, if you're a South African, you, you do not shed tears watching this series. It's it's amazing. And Sia Khaleesi's story is a brilliant one. Um, and then I, I love that. And that, that was the bit that got me when the person introducing him to get his World Cup cap said, Sia, Sia is our grandson, he is our son, he is our younger brother, he is our uncle. It's just like, it gets you. There's a lot of feels in this series. Uh, then it cuts to the coaches meeting, and again, the access that you get, you get to hear all the thought process of the coaches, this time building up to the Tonga game, but um, it's the identification. Well, Felix Jones said, we failed mentally against Ireland. And Rassi Erasmus has spotted that there's an issue between Dwayne Vermeulen, Eben Etzebeth, Sia Khaleesi, the leaders, not all in agreement. And that's causing little wedges in the group. It, well, how did he put it? His three big dogs are not patrolling together. So he shuts them in a room until they work it out. <laughs> Again, brilliant leadership. And you see um, the two of them, Dwayne Vermeulen and Eben Etzebeth, very much on the same page uh, soon afterwards. So just great man management once again 
from Rassi Erasmus. Uh, we we then see the the, to- the preparation for the Tongan game, and I was I was watching this part. We we're again we're in the coaches' room, and I was squinting to try and read what was on the screen. So I thought, oh wow, maybe there's something on there. But it doesn't matter because they just show you what was on the screen. And I find this I find all this sort of stuff fascinating. So you see that the thought with South Africa, the coaches have identified that Tonga hang in there for 50 minutes, and then they fall off. There's I can't totally read here, but there's all sorts of different moves for different parts of the game. They've highlighted the bunker uh, as an issue. Presumably, like, discipline is going to be massive. And also, at this point, and I'd kind of forgotten that South Africa could technically have been eliminated, however unlikely that would have been. We then see the Tonga game, and it takes a casualty in Makazoli Mapimpi. But it also sees the uh, the coming of age as an international hooker on this stage of Dion Ferri, who is man of the match, and a lovely moment at the end of Tonga against uh, against South Africa. Now... This was a new one on me. Uh, I managed to watch a, um, uh, a stream from South Africa. Don't judge me. Uh, anyway, I was watching <laughs> and I was blown away by the amount of advertisements that there are with the Springbok team. And I know this is during a documentary. But nevertheless, this would never happen with the England team. Yes, you see billboards, you see the odd advert. But there's just so many and it just gave me another glimpse at just and it gives you another sense of just how massive rugby union is because this is the sort of thing you would see with you know the, the best footballers in England. I live in Manchester and this is what you get with Erling Haaland and and Bruno Fernandes and and you know the big players the big footballers you'd never get this with a Sale Sharks player although Faf de Klerk was a Sale Sharks player and there he is in a very small bath um, selling insurance. <laughs> there he is on a lilo in his famous budgie smugglers as well. Uh, then we saw um, some members of the Springbok squad scrummaging with a Toyota v- uh, truck and then them drinking water. Um, uh, just, it, again, another little glimpse into just how big rugby is. But then we go, here we go. The next part of the episode, we're into the preparation for France. And we're back in the coach's room and Felix Jones, he's giving so much tactical detail just as an Englishman. I'm very excited that Felix Jones is now part of the England setup because he looks like a very, very smart coach. Uh, looks like a very smart man indeed. So a uh, shrewd signing perhaps for, from Steve Borthwick, we'll see. But he said he, he went down a rabbit hole on YouTube. I'm imagining Felix Jones probably found me on YouTube. Hi, Felix. I bet you Felix Jones subscribes. You should subscribe as well if you haven't already. Just like Felix, subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up. Leave your comments down below as well. Felix Jones definitely subscribes. But once again, just like the last episode, the, the producers of the show highlight the media reaction, particularly the old, the old favourite Matt Williams saying that South Africa do not want to play France. Of all the teams, they don't want to play France. Uh, and then we see the coaches talking, um, talking things through and, yeah, saying, let France worry about us. Then we get another moment where you get choked up. Oh my goodness me, this show takes you on an emotional roller coaster, doesn't it? Uh, Dion Ferri, uh, I didn't realise about the the, um, the situation with his dad and his mum deciding not to tell him. That, that was an emotional moment. And then the, the, the extent that South Africa went to to keep things secret, uh, paranoid and maybe justifiably so about people snooping on their training sessions. After all, they're in the, they're in the country of the hosts and their next opponents. So they even uh, sent uh, people up a ladder to cover up CCTV cameras, which is amazing. And then I hadn't heard about this, this this software that they use with everyone having a little game controller and playing their part. And they used it effectively to to plan what would become the crossfield kicks, which, as we know now, worked brilliantly well in the quarterfinals. That was that was awesome as well. Uh, then we get closer to match day. I love this moment actually. It was when the there was all those their final training session before the quarterfinal, and a load of people came to. Um, to join them, South Africans to, to come to come and sing. Now, I'm pretty sure that I actually met these people after the first game against Scotland outside the stadium in Marseille. If you want to get nostalgic for the World Cup and go back and check out all my old content, it's all there in the channel. Uh, thanks very much for watching. I think it's the same people. But anyway, uh, we get on and it's game time. Oh, yeah, not before another little advert break and more South Africans... Um, this time selling uh, a, a chain of garages. Um, and then we also get the Kurt Lee Arentzer backstory before we get to the game. 
that was a lovely little story as well. And again, you get choked up when you realise the journey that some of these people have gone on to, the sacrifices they made and the help that they've got to get where they're going. But yeah, as I say, we get to game day and the great Antoine Dupont stood in the tunnel, the, cr the French crowd, but to prepare them for the national anthem and for the noise of the crowd, uh, this was my favourite bit of the episode. Rassi Erasmus walking around the training pitch with a, with a speaker, <laughs> following them wherever the player goes. The players go blasting out a le bleu and the French national anthem. Absolutely amazing. I mean, it, it, it's a smart idea anyway, but the thing I love most about this, I love the idea, but I love that it's Rassi himself that's the one doing it. The head honcho is the guy that's carting the mobile speaker around the pitch, just trying to avoid all the rocks and malls as they're happening. Absolutely brilliant. Anyway, we get into the game and it's absolutely dynamite. Yet there's so much you forget happened. That near miss with Louis Biel Biere, uh, B uh, Kurt Lierentzer having to come to the rescue to save South Africa in those opening moments. Cyril Bai scored a try, but then there was, uh, and then South Africa got the Curly, Kurt Lierentzer got the try, but Eben Etzebeth with the knock back, was it forward, was it flat? That's what the referee thought anyway. And I absolutely love this. So after Kurt Lierentzer had scored the try, um, the, the, it cuts to shots of Marnie Leboc lining up the kick with commentary from, and I apologise, I don't know which one of the many languages of South Africa it is. I have seen some entertaining Schulzer, uh commentary before, so it may have been that, but saying, do it, son of Libok. This is your time, my chap. Um, stuff like that. It was, it was, just, it was absolutely magic um, hearing a bit of that as well. And uh, he nails that touchline conversion. And then he goes for the crossfield kick, which works out brilliantly with a Damien Dialende try, 12-7 up. Uh, then... France hit back and it's 12-12 and then it's that moment with Cheslin Colby. And remember, all this is all in the first half. I'd forgotten that this was just all in such a condensed period of time. It was, it's probably the greatest game I've ever watched. Absolutely no question, the greatest half of rugby I've ever seen in my life. Um, Cheslin Colby then becomes the hero again with a try. Uh, and I'd forgotten about this as well. But look... Bearing in mind, in the pool stages, Owen Farrell got called for a shot clock violation against Samoa, wasn't it, in Lille, in the game there. Was, uh, was Marnie Leboc a little bit lucky? He left that very, very close. I'd forgotten that as well. Um, and then the, 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 the iconic moment with Damien Willemse calling the mark, and we get the thinking on that, the fact that it was something they thought about a long time. They checked with the referee, can you do it? They looked at the stats from 2022, when the uh, another incredible game, that one in Marseille in, a year before the World Cup, where there was only one scrum in the entire game, or South Africa only had one scrum um, between uh, in the game against France. And so they thought, well, let's leverage this a little bit more. So you saw the thinking of it, uh, tactically amazing. And then uh, I like the enjoyment, Damien Willemse, recreated the um and uh Razzie even got stuck in and <laughs> did it himself as well a, a, just a magic moment and then there was the yellow card for Evan Etzebeth this is all in the first half and that's where the half time ends and just as we've got through the whole series so far you see complete access all of the talk from the coaches even to the point of uh, the point where Razzie Erasmus is showing the team how you tackle Antoine Dupont by doing it on Felix Jones, um, awesome stuff. And he finishes by saying, be wild effing dogs. And that is the end of uh, episode three of Chasing the Effing Sun. I cannot wait for episode four already. I love it. Uh, if you haven't already, hit subscribe on the channel. I'd love to earn your subscription. Uh, give the video a thumbs up as well. It's just me, I'm Tim, this is Egg Chasers. And uh, I've spent no money on marketing and uh, I, I rely on you to tell other people, tell your mates, or just to give the video a thumbs up and that really helps as well. So does leaving a comment. Drop a little comment down below and that really helps me out. It costs you nothing, but means a lot. I'll see you on the next one.